Good day, beloved in Christ. Welcome to prayer for Wednesday, the 10th of March. Reading from For All the Saints, Robert McRae became the first primate of the Anglican Church of Canada in 1893, and as we honor his life and service, we also commemorate the formation of our Church as a united and independent member in the Anglican Communion. McRae was a Scot, born and raised as a Presbyterian. From an early age, he showed great talent as a mathematician, and after studies in the university of his native Aberdeen, he went south on a scholarship to Cambridge University. It was there that he became an Anglican. Granted a fellowship, then ordained priest, he seemed to be slated for the career of an academic clergyman. But in 1865, much to his surprise, he was chosen to become the second bishop of Rupert's Land. He arrived at Winnipeg in August of the same year. McRae's diocese included much of the Arctic as well as the Canadian prairies. He set himself two long-range goals, first to nurture higher education in Manitoba, and second to divide Rupert's land into smaller diocesan units which would be better able to serve Anglican settlers and carry out missionary work. One of his first acts as bishop was to call a clergy conference, which he patiently developed into a full-fledged synod. In time, as McRae's wider plans matured, this body became the basis for a provincial synod. Under his leadership, the Western Synods led the way in calling for unification of the Anglican Church in Canada. This movement bore fruit in 1893, when the first General Synod of our Church met at Toronto. McRae was elected primate at this seminal gathering. He remained primate, as well as Archbishop of Rupert's Land, until his death in 1904. McRae was a tireless worker with a genius for organization. It may be no surprise that he liked to relax by solving mathematical puzzles. But he also possessed a generous heart and was able to work well with a wide variety of people. His vision, integrity, and practical wisdom made him one of the true founders of our church in this nation. Let us pray. Almighty God, you instructed the heart of Robert McRae to guide the Anglicans of this nation in the counsels of peace and unity. Preserve us in wisdom and lead us in truth, that we may build upon the one foundation, which is Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's take a deep breath as we continue, be in touch with our bodies, our hearts opening to God. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and He will sustain you. Together, and He will sustain you. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful Spirit, and sustain me with your bountiful Spirit. Blessed is the Lord day by day, the God of our salvation who bears our burdens, the God of our salvation who bears our burdens. Today our psalm reading is 119 verses 97 to 120 recalling that Psalm 119 is that long and beautiful and well-crafted love song to God's law, the revelation of God's desires for humanity. Now, this love song may confuse us a bit because we've just been reading in Romans where Paul doesn't seem to have much positive to say about the law in terms of how it affects human beings. This would be to read Paul incorrectly. Paul's point really is, in the Romans chapter there, that the function of the law is to rouse our conscience to the knowledge of God's demands and our own sin and failures thereof. 
but it is trust in God's goodness and benevolence which precedes the giving of the law. So human beings have always been saved by trusting in God's provision for them, not by keeping the letter of the law. Those who strive to keep the letter of the law without faith, trusting in God's goodness, they would find the law to be oppressive and they may quit and rebel against the law or they may perform so much of the law that they become proud and see no need for faith and become self-dependent. So there are dangers that St. Paul saw in the law, but always remembering that we are firstly saved by trusting in God's goodness and provision, and the law is meant to teach us God's way in the world. And here we have this ancient psalmist singing praise for the beauty of God's law. Oh, how I love your law. All the day long it is in my mind. Your commandment has made me wiser than my enemies, and it is always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your decrees are my study. I am wiser than the elders, because I observe your commandments. I restrain my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I do not shrink from your judgments because you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. They are sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your commandments I gain understanding. Therefore I hate every lying way. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips, and teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. I hate those who have a divided heart, but your law do I love. You are my refuge and shield. My hope is in your word. Away from me, you wicked. I will keep the commandments of my God. Sustain me according to your promise that I may live, and let me not be disappointed in my hope. Hold me up, and I shall be safe and my delight shall be ever in your statutes. You spurn all who stray from your statutes. Their deceitfulness is in vain. In your sight all the wicked of the earth are but dross. Therefore I love your decrees. My flesh trembles with dread of you. I am afraid of your judgments. Let us pray. As of old, O Lord our God, you gave commandments to make one nation just and true. So, by your incarnate word, you make all peoples one in grace and in the perfect freedom of your service. We give thanks to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Here you'll find an odd term in Scripture. Paul speaks of boasting, and most of us are taught that boasting is rude. This is a rhetorical use of the word boast by St. Paul, and Paul was trained in rhetoric, the art of persuasion and eloquence. So boasting here really is getting at the point of an exaggeration of confidence, joy, and gratitude. And do remember that I am substituting the word trust where faith is found in the text because trust dictates a response whereas faith may be just seen as a passive thinking about what is right. Trust demands a response of us. Reading now. Now that we have been put right with God through trust, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has brought us by trust 
into this experience of God's grace in which we now live, and so we boast of the hope we have of sharing God's glory. We also boast of our troubles, because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance brings God's approval, and God's approval creates hope. This hope does not disappoint us, for God has poured out His love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. For when we were still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. It may even be that someone might dare to die for a good person. But God has shown us how much He loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. By His sacrificial death we are now put right with God. How much more, then, will we be saved by Him from God's anger? We were God's enemies, but He made us His friends through the death of His Son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? But that is not all. We rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made us God's friends. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Honestly, friends, this is such glorious good news that through the work of Christ, God has befriended us. This picks up with what Jesus says in John chapter fifteen, fifteen. Jesus says, I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. We have been made friends with God through the saving work of Jesus Christ. This is the glorious great news. It, you can understand why Paul's saying we can boast in that. Boast in be grateful, confident, and full of joy. Are you on friendly terms with God? Do you understand your calling in Christ to be befriended by God and to live life as a friend of God? Our psalm reading ended with this line, which may have struck you, piqued your interest, and felt a little bit odd out of context almost. Verse 120 of Psalm 119, My flesh trembles with dread of you. I am afraid of your judgments. This, I believe, is best understood as the type of fear in a friendship when one friend is afraid to have offended the other and to put the friendship at jeopardy. May we walk in the light that we not put our friendship with God at jeopardy from our side, knowing that God from God's side would never put our friendship in jeopardy. Turning now to our intercessions. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, responding to Lord with, We pray to you that this day may be holy, good, and peaceful. Lord, we pray to you that the work we will do this day and the people we will meet may bring us closer to you. Lord, we pray to you that by your goodness and grace we as your friends may be forgiven our sins and offenses. Lord, we pray to you that we may hear and respond to your call to peace and justice. Lord, we pray to you that you will sustain the faith and hope of the weary, the lonely, and the oppressed. Lord, we pray to you that you will strengthen us in your service and fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit and longing for your kingdom. Lord, we pray to you. Gathering our prayers, we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial 
and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of God, which passes understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down from heaven and rest upon you in all that you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Have a blessed day today, O friend of God.